like to welcome everyone on behalf of the Wilson Center and the National History Center. Our guest this afternoon is going to be introduced by Christian Osterman. Yes, welcome everyone to this installment of the Washington History Seminar. Uh, we're delighted um, this afternoon to uh, present to you, uh, to feature Professor Dina Curry, who is an expert on the history of the Middle East. And she's also, of course, an associate professor of history and international affairs at George Washington University. Prior to uh, Georgetown, uh, she taught, uh, prior to George Washington, she taught at Georgetown and was the recipient of a Social Science Research Council grant for two consecutive years. Uh, Dina's research uh, and writing spans the early and modern history of the Middle East. Her first book, um, State and Provincial Society in the Ottoman Empire, published in 1997, and second edition in 2002, uh, won the Turkish Studies Association and the British Society of Middle Eastern Studies Awards. It explores the relationship between the Ottoman state and a group of local power holders and urban gentry on the eastern Iraqi frontiers of the Ottoman Empire. She has also written on the politics of reform and rebellion in the 18th and 19th century, uh, in 18th and 19th century Baghdad. Um, since 2007, she has, been <coughs> she has been researching and writing on war and memory. Uh, and of course, her new book, her recent book, is Iraq in Wartime, Soldiering, Martyrdom, and Remembrance, published uh, just a couple of months ago, draw a study that draws on government documents and interviews to argue that war, well, we'll hear what it will argue, but... Um, uh, to, to argue that war was a form of everyday bureaucratic governance that transformed the manner in which Iraqis made claims to citizenship and expressed notions of selfhood. Uh, she is, uh, she, she's been awarded um, with a number of um, major and distinguished grants, um, most recently a John Simon Guggenheim Foundation uh, Fellowship, um, she received her PhD from Georgetown University and her BA from American University in Beirut. With that, um, thank you for joining us um, and uh, you have the floor, Dina. Thank you. I find it easier to put this side in that. Okay. Um, thank you all for coming and thank you for inviting me to be part of this forum. It's quite exciting. Uh, what I'll be talking to you today about uh, draws on uh, my book, Iraq in Wartime. And I began uh, thinking through researching and writing the book uh, in the midst of Iraq's disintegration, um, insurgency, counterinsurgency, sectarian violence. Um, okay. Uh, sectarian violence and the kleptocratic political and business elite, and basically the erosion of the center that held Iraqis together. It seems to me that Iraq's history in the last 30 years or so has been marked by a series of crises and ruptures that have continued to upend and reshape state structures and identity politics. And so I started thinking that these ruptures had to be studied as a force of change in their own rights. So I wanted to write Iraqi history through its wars. To what extent did these ruptures reshape state rule, identity and cultural politics, and in, in, in the case of today's presentation, practices of citizenship? My main inspiration for writing this book came from the growing literature on what the, the way the state uh, the growing literature on the way that a state of permanent war, particularly after 9-11, structures politics, law, mm -hmm. culture, and citizenship. Hannah Arendt had reminded us of the thin line that divides peace and war, and the importance of understanding violence as part of governance as early as the 1960, uh, 1967, and I'm thinking in particular on her book on violence. 
my interest was to study war as a form of bureaucratic governance, drawing on Ba'ath Party documents and oral interviews I conducted with soldiers who fought in the Iran-Iraq and the first Gulf Wars. And the central problem for me was try to explain how what uh, uh, historian Partha Chatterjee calls the multiple techniques of administration, of, and this is his, his term, of a welfare corporatist state like the Ba'ath were changed when Iraq became a national security and a counterinsurgency state. And I thought the best way to do this was to focus on soldiers and their families because they became become the chief targets of state policies in the 80s and 90s. From then on, I began to look at how state institutions and the members of the Ba'ath Party tried to sh shape the war story and to develop and maintain social policy governing soldiers and martyrs' families, and how the state created categories of inclusion and exclusion based on so soldiering and martyrdom. In effect, the study spells out the processes of militarization of Iraqi society and culture. Now, Iraq presents a particular conundrum for scholars trying to understand the impact of war on society, particularly on notions of citizenship and belonging. In the space of 23 years, that is to say the last 23 years of Ba'athist rule, it experienced four kinds of war, all of them devastating to various sectors of the Iraqi population. Between 1980 and 1988, the Iraqi government fought a traditional war centered on the deployment of large infantry divisions across national frontiers. At the same time, it carried out counterinsurgency campaigns against sectors of the southern population and against, against Kurdish insurgent national parties in the north of the country. And that particular culminate, uh, campaign culminated in the ethnic cleansing of Kurds, as many of you know. The first Gulf War was marked by the mobilization of soldiers to occupy another Arab country and pitted a dilapidated Third World Army against the technologi technological might of the US military war machine. As we all know, the war was short and brutal. The UN sanctioned embargo, which Joy Gordon has characterized as an invisible war, entailed severe limitations on the territorial and economic sovereignty of the Iraqi state and the deployment of a belligerent humanitarianism that threatened the biological security of entire civilian populations. What I'd like to do today in the time allotted to me is talk to you about the impact of these different kinds of engagement with violence on citizens' rights in, Ku in, in Kuwait and in Iraq. In particular, I'll show that these wars privileged a militarized definition of citizenship based on soldiering and death, and death for the nation. But I will also show, however, that while privileging martyrdom became a means to make claims on the state's resources, particularly for, <coughs> when I mean here, making claims by citizens, and on the cultural capital of the Iraqi nation, martyrdom itself was an evolving concept, both in its legal definition and in the manner that it was culturally celebrated in Iraq. So for example, while the rights of martyrs were defined as those of fallen soldiers during the Iran-Iraq war, the Gulf War and the embargo expanded the definition of a martyr and his rights to include civilian victims of the US bombing and of the embargo. How and why this reworking of martyrdom happens has a great deal to do with the changing nature of war that is to say, the kinds of war that the Iraqi government had to contend with. In addition, the government's reworking of the definition of the rights of martyrs was also the result of the insistent claims made by various Iraqi constituencies that the death of their relative be classified under the category of martyrdom. So it was a two-way process. Important as well is the fact that throughout the Iran-Iraq and the first Gulf Wars, and until the fall of the regime in 2003, there was an alternative definition of martyrdom. And that alternative definition was associated with entitlements that was developed by the Kurdish opposition and Shi'i Islamist parties working to dislodge the Ba'ath and adamantly opposed to seeing the fallen of both wars as martyrs. 
By the end of the Ba'athist regime and continuing to the present, the evolving and contested meaning of martyrdom as a ca category of privileged citizenship attests to the lack of consensus, I think, about the narrative of Iraq's war among Iraqis, as it does to the entrenchment of martyrdom as a category of privileged citizenship in a country where perpetual violence is the norm rather than the exception. So let me turn now to the meat of my presentation. Let me begin briefly by going over the definition of citizens' rights in, Bathist, in the Ba'athist state before the beginning of the Iran-Iraq war. The legal underpinnings of Iraqi citizens' rights under the Ba'athist regime were spelled out in the interim constitution of 1970. Iraqis were defined as belonging to two ethnic groups, Kurds and Arabs. They were all equal citizens of a socialist Arab state whose primary goal was, according to the Constitution, the planning, directing, and steering of the national economy, as it was the, the protection of the national, uh, nation's territorial integrity. The state was the caretaker of national resources, so it could make, according to the Constitution, available the means of enjoying the achievements of modernization by the popular masses, and to generalize the progressive accomplishments of contemporary civilization to all citizens. In that respect, it's very much like any developmentalist state in third world countries seeking to get its legitimacy and its definitions of citizenship from participating in a, a corporatist state structure. As a state focused on development, its primary goal was to foster, according to the, uh, to the Constitution, social solidarity by ensuring that citizens had equal rights to free education, healthcare, and full employment. These rights remained the mainstay of the Ba'athist government's policies and central to its claim to legitimacy until the middle of the 1970s. However, these rights become increasingly circumscribed by a series of exclusions that denied to non-Ba'athists as well as to those who had belonged to outlawed parties access to vital government institutions and agencies. Although the Ba'ath came to power in 1968, it was only in 1978 that Iraq officially became a one-party state, outlawing all opposition parties. By 1979, the Iraqi government's definition of social and civil rights had become bound to one's political affiliation. To have full citizens' rights in Ba'athist state, one had to belong to the party because its ideology, its practice, uh, and practice fused party, state, and nation in one. Political organizations opposed to the Ba'ath, whose existence had been legal until the 1970 interim constitution, were now declared traitorous, and their followers and their families were excluded from select rights. Now things begin where re the definition of citizenship re changes with the onset of the Iran-Iraq war. A series of resolutions and decrees issued by the Revolutionary Command Council, the only legislative and ex uh, executive body in the nation, redefined further the rights of citizenship that had been established in the 1970 interim constitution. A new system of entitlements was created to reward those who had contributed to the war, notwithstanding their party affiliation. At the same time, increasingly draconian rules governed dis the disenfranchisement of categories of people deemed detrimental to the war effort, in particular those Iraqis that are grouped as of Iranian affiliation, Kurds accused of insurgency, and deserters from the army. Such drastic reworking of the legal basis of Iraqi citizens' right had to do with the monopolization of legislation on such issues by the RCC, the Revolutionary Command Council, at the expense of civil and military courts, as well as various ministries, including the Ministry of Justice uh, and the Ministry of Defense. The RCC now had oversight over much of the nation's decision-making on development, finance, and law. The underlying logic of much of the legislation that was, uh, was that Qadisiyat Saddam, which was the official uh, title of the war, was the first wall of national security, and as such, 
was unprecedented in Iraqi history. From the outset of the process of, the process of expanding older entitle entitlements required redefining categories of citizens' rights. For example, determining the official boundaries of martyrdom, for example, soon became more challenging to the government, more at least than the government had anticipated. Was the fallen soldier a martyr of the nation and the party, or did his death in Qadisi at Saddam allow him a different status as a citizen? Two organizations dealt with martyrs' rights in the 1980s, the Ministry of Defense and the Ba'ath Party. Each had its own definition of martyrdom. For the Ministry of Defense, the martyred was an enlisted soldier who had died in the line of fire. His rights and those of his survivors were governed by laws and regulations issued in 1975 that covered retirement, martyrdom, and disability under the rubric of law of service and retirement. Compensations to the uh, fallen soldier's family included his retirement salary, according to his grade, medical care, the right to shop at armed forces stores. This is familiar to all of you who uh, deal with veterans. For the Ba'ath Party, the martyr was an individual, civilian or military, who had died in the service of the party and in the cause of the Arab nation as defined by the Ba'ath. A directive issued by the party's general secretariat in 1979 spelled out the benefits accruing to a martyr and his family. The martyr rank in the Ba'ath Party hierarchy was posthumously elevated so that if he was at the rank of advocate, which is the entry-level rank, he was promoted two grades into a member after his death. The, ba the party took it upon itself to res the responsibility to protect the martyr's family, much as a father had done. The martyr's children were inducted into the party and given the rank of advocate. With, with it came a host of benefits, including an accelerated track up the ladder of the party, and the prospects of joining government and state institutions reserved for Ba'athists. Party officials were expected to visit martyrs' families and give them gifts on national and religious occasions. During the Iran-Iraq War, the government reworked these rights, both for the Ministry of Defense and the Ba'ath, by issuing a number of resolutions that elevated martyrdom and Qadisiyat Saddam to a privileged category of citizenship well beyond the confines of the rights defined by the Ministry of Defense and by the Ba'ath Party. The resolutions were enacted to deal with two problems. The first had to do with the government's need to create reward system that would motivate conscripts to keep fighting and put them on a par with enlisted men who had volunteered <coughs> to join the armed forces. The second problem went to the heart of the definition of the Ba'ath state at war. Were soldiers who had died defending the nation to be considered martyrs of the Ba'athist revolution, and they always called it the revolution, which had now melded party, state, and nation. To deal with the first problem, the RCC issued resolutions that allowed the president of Iraq to override laws governing compensation and promotion within the military, within the military laws that governed those for the Ministry of Defense, granting him the prerogative to issue compensations and medals. The president could also expand the benefits to the martyr's family beyond those required by military laws of promotion. For example, as an example, the martyr was promoted one grade above his rank as an enlisted man or pay grade if he was a government employee conscripted into the army after his, uh, after his death. The children and the grandchildren of martyrs were exempt from general requirements set by ministries of education, interior defense, particularly governing grades, the, if, should they decide to join the military and police academies or even medical schools and engineering schools, highly prized entry, uh, schools to go into. In the 19, uh, in, as the number, number of the dead mounted, citizens' petitions processed through local Ba'ath Party offices clamored for the designation of martyr for all those who died as a result of war, even if their manner of death didn't strictly fall within the Ministry of Defense's death under fire. Now, the government also turned its, its, uh, its attention to the second problem. Was a martyr dying for the nation or the party? 
In the early months of the Iran-Iraq war, the RCC issued a resolution inducting posthumously all those who were non-Ba'athist martyrs into the Ba'ath party and promoted enlisted and conscripted members within the mar party. So it is an ultimate irony. If you had managed to live your life without joining, joining the party in your death, you were made privileged member of the party. The decision had an ideological underpinning. Since the nation, armed forces, and the party were synonymous, to die serving one meant dying to, ser to die serving all. Within this definition of martyrdom, it was difficult to assert that martyrs who did not belong to the party had no rights. The entitlements that ac had accrued only to party members before the war were now extended to martyrs' families, even if they had not been party members or had been at the le low level in the party hierarchy. By the end of the war, the definition of the rights of martyrs as citizens had gone beyond those determined by military laws of retirement and benefits within the Ministry of Defense and well beyond the ceremonial and paternalistic definitions of the Ba'ath Party. With the emergence of a citizen army and the increasing number of casualties, martyrdom was now elevated to an exalted category of citizenship accompanied by a widely expanded number of rights and bolstered by a cultural and social apparatus that privileged claims to martyrdom. But well, how did this exalted category of citizens meet? What did it mean in practice? How did it work on the ground? So if you know, figure out very soon after you start working with part Ba'ath Party archives that the Ba'ath Party creates its own world and lives in it. But, and so you have to read these archives very closely to see how this, if how these resolutions actually worked in practice. And you can read them sort of against the grain to figure that out. From the beginning, martyrs' entitlements were confusing and negotiable. To claim benefits to land, cars, and privileges, martyrs' families had to deal with multiple institutions that had overlapping jurisdictions. It was a bureaucratic nightmare for the families. Increasingly, as the war progressed, the rights of martyrs became very particularistic. Entitlements were granted according to military, party rank, number of medals. Entitlements were also subject to periodic modifications by the state. These happened with remarkable regularity during the many national celebrations when the leader and the party rewarded a certain category of martyr with new entitlements. Families of martyrs within the party, for example, wrote to the general secretariat seeking further, seeking further promotion of their dead relatives in order to garner specific entitlements that were dist distributed by the leader on a particular national occasion. The, family experience, the family's experiences interacting with the bureaucracy differed depending on the rank and the soldier of the, mar of the soldier martyr. Soldier, for example, families of, of officers and enlisted soldiers navigated the relatively organized uh, bureaucracy of the Ministry of Defense they could appeal to a, an organization, a veterans organization called the Committee for the Protection of Soldiers of Qadisiyah Sub Saddam, which was an intergovernmental agency devoted to the problems of enlisted men and, uh, and officers. But if you were a conscript and you were a family of a conscript, things were much more difficult. You often had to resort to local branches of the Ba'ath Party to help interpret the various resolutions that continued to redefine the meaning of martyrdom. So acute was the problem of managing the multiple claims by martyrs' families that in 1989, the Ba'ath was tasked by the Office of the <coughs> Presidency with issuing recommendations on how to streamline the process. The resultant recommendation was to create an intergovernmental agency similar to that created to deal with the war injured and attach it to the office of the presidency. Among the agency's proposed functions was the coordination between various state agencies that determine and dispense entitlements. Its recommendations were never acted upon because as the first Gulf War ushered the new step and that uh, in defining martyrdom and further complicated that further complicated matters. Now, the first Gulf War and the ensuing uprising against, the, in 1991, in March of 1991, some one, 15 provinces of, the Iraq, of Iraq 
rose up against uh, the Ba'athist regime. Oh, the, both the war and the uprising uh, compelled the Iraqi regime to re-examine the official definition of martyrdom. Bombardment of civilian targets and the killing of number, number of Ba'ath party cadres by the rebels erased the clear distinction between civilian and combatant deaths. At the same time, the rebels challenged the sanctioned definition of, the Qadisiyat Sadd of martyrs of Qadisiyat Saddam and of the Gulf War soon after they took control in March of 1991. And the rebels had variously control over different cities on, and provinces of Iraq from two to nine days. But in it, as soon as they took control of, of hospitals and these cities, they issued certificates of martyrdom that challenged the official version. I mean, it, they, it didn't take them much to process all of this. So for example, in Basra, where the rebels were in control of the hospital for more, no more than three days, uh, they, the, they issued uh, certificates of martyrdom to those killed by government forces during the uprising. They were endorsed by the Iraqi opposition parties who had fought with Iranians against their countrymen during the Iran-Iraq war. Iraqi Islamist parties in Iran, as well as Kurdish parties, had from the war's onset, that is to say the Iran-Iraq war onset and the first Gulf War, declared that those of their men who had died fighting the Iraqi army were martyrs fighting an unjust Ba'athist war. By September of 1991, the Revolutionary Command Council had begun to set up mechanisms to assess who would be considered a martyr in this latest war. It determined that the mother of all battles, which was the first Gulf War, had started on August 2nd, 1990, which is the date of the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait, and that it was in ongoing. Those conscripted or enlisted soldiers killed during the invasion and the ensuing 42-day war, as well as those fr from the security intelligence apparatus, as well as the popular army, which was the, uh, the party militia, were considered martyrs. The council extended the martyrs right that accrued to combatants during the Iran-Iraq war to those of the Gulf War as well. Now the designation of the mother of all battles as an ongoing war, however, created the means by which various constituencies in Iraq could claim the rights of martyrs. The Ba'ath party was among the first to insist that those of its members who had been slain by the rebels be considered martyrs of the mother of all battles, even though they were civilians. In the first months after the uprising, it proceeded to create application forms for members who wanted to file claims to martyrs' entitlements on behalf of the slain relative. And to understand all of this, one has to understand how bureaucratized the whole process of declaring one martyrs becomes by even by 1990 uh, and 91. Now other party members challenged the narrow definition of the government as well. If the mother of all battles was an ongoing war, one party member from Mosul wrote in 1994, we are in the third phase of the battle having withstood the coalition's attacks and the page of treachery and betrayal, which was the official name of the uprising against the regime. The third phase was characterized by, according to this uh, party official, smuggling and economic destruction by the avariciousness of merchants and the devastation of the psyche by the enemies. As the situation escalates to actual battles and as the smuggler and saboteur obtains all kinds of weapons to resist our squads, that is to say the security squads of the Ba'ath party, and some injuries and deaths occur, we suggest that those martyred in confrontation be considered martyrs of the mother of all battles and be awarded the same privileges. To deal with the proliferation of claims, the regime established levels of martyrdom and made entitlements dependent on one's position in a hierarchy of victimhood. On December 24, 1993, the RCC resolution declared all families of martyred soldiers of Qadisiyat Saddam and the mother of all battles, friends of Saddam. That's another category of citizenship that emerges in the 1990s. They now received periodic salaries, salary raises and entitlements granted by Hussein on many national occasions. 
Those families whose martyr had received badges of courage before his death were accorded more privileges than those who had merely died serving the nation. In 1999, the heads of families who had given three martyrs or more to Qadisiyat Saddam and the mother of old Bethel were granted a, civ a Rafidain civilian badge, one of the highest honors of the country. With that badge came ad additional privileges. So this increased differentiation of categories aroused great confusion among martyrs' families. Not only were they now required to obtain further identification to claim their entitlement, but they also had to go through a bureaucratic wrangle to do that. Complaints by citizens led the Ministry of Defense and other organizations dealing with martyrs' families to designate special days just to process the entitlements of Friends of Saddam. And the line between martyr, combatant, and civilian victim continued to erode throughout the 1990s. The, ero the erosion was partly encouraged by a government cognizant of the changed rules of engagement that came with the first Gulf War and the sanctions, when civilian populations became the primary target. It was equally fueled by the rising clamor of a population with rapidly diminished res diminishing resources. Death and victimhood became a means of negotiating a measure of security and survival in an otherwise precarious economic environment. Now, the shift in the definition of martyrdom is also reflected in the commemorative practices of the state. We see a change from the commemoration of soldiers as martyrs of the Iran-Iraq war to, elevation, to an elevation of civilian victims as the ideal martyrs during the Gulf War and the embargo years. Equally important, the shift to civilian victims came as a result of the erosion of a modicum of national consensus on the definition of martyrdom that he had existed in the Iran-Iraq war and the ability of the state to project itself as a protector of the Iraqi people. So let me say a few words before I conclude about the transformation in the meaning of martyrdom as it was reflected in the commemorative practices by the Iraqi state. On February 16, 1981, the mayor of Baghdad, Samir Abdel Wahab al-Sheikhli, made public the government's intention to build a $40 million uh, dollar monument commemorating the dead of the Iran-Iraq war. This is, and this is it. Conceived by Ismail Fattah al-Turk and drafted uh, artist Ismail Fattah al-Turk and drafted by a team of architects from the Baghdad School of Architecture, the monument consisted of a circular platform Floating, uh, floating, over underground, uh, floating over an underground museum and carrying a 40 meter high split dome. Set in the middle of an artificial lake, the monument stood apart from the city's high rises and bustle and was meant to create a space of reflection on the meaning of death. Now, the martyr's monument signaled the intention of the state to offer a distinct place to those martyred in the, Iran, uh, the, in the war with Iran. It distinguished them from martyrs of the for the nation among the armed forces and from the Ba'ath party who had come before them. The martyr's monument, officially entitled Monument for the, of the Martyrs of Qadisiyat Saddam, commemorated the death of citizen soldiers in the first national war in which mass death had become the norm. The government's goals were to, national, uh, to nationalize their death, create rituals that commemorated the fallen, render their death acceptable to their families, and do so while condoning the meaning of that loss. In January 1982, the government declared December 1, the day that Iranian forces executed, captured Iraqi soldiers in the Battle of Bustan, a national day of mourning for the fallen soldiers of the Iran-Iraq war. In the first years uh, of the war, cultural institutions in cooperation with the Ba'ath Party undertook a systematic effort to sanctify death of soldiers by developing rituals that gave meaning to their death within the narrow confines of a secularized reading of martyrdom in Islam and a Ba'athist interpretation of Iraqi Arab nationalism. And this is a picture, I think it's a 1999 picture of uh, teachers taking students to visit the monument on Martyrs' Day, and uh, 
I thought I couldn't resist this one. Our martyrs are the symbols of victory and the opposite side advertisement for life insurance policy, I thought. And uh, this is martyrs medallion ceremony on Martyrs Day. Uh, you can see Saddam Hussein giving a medallion to the children of martyrs. And these are the medallions and martyrs pins that were given out to children of martyrs. And the, the medallion that has uh, uh, martyrs are more honorable than all of us with the rose coming out of the monument was worn by all children on Martyrs Day and school children on Martyr Days and government employees as well. Now, these efforts were centralized and authoritarian. They did not allow for any development of community-based rituals of mourning or the formation of independent organizations of martyrs' families. Their, person, their purpose was to depersonalize and routinize death. Above all, they were designed to project, uh, designed to foster and project unity of Iraq's diverse population and bolster national support for the war by highlighting martyrs' families' contribution and the leadership's uh, generosity, as you could tell from uh, this picture. The routine and ritualized practices created a modicum of consensus among the majority of Iraqis on the meaning of death for the nation. Soldiers died to protect Iraqi soil, soil from Iranian aggression, even if such death did not have for their families or many in the nation. The same meaning ascribed to it uh, by the Ba'athist ideolo uh, ideology. Now, to ascribe meaning to the death of fallen soldiers, the organizations of public culture, particularly those run by the Ministry of Culture and Information, drew on two related nationalist discourses. The first was thoroughly secular and derived from the rhetoric of anti-colonial struggles. The martyrs of the war against Iran were the children of martyrs who had fought the British colonial subjugation, first during the 1920 uh, revolution uh, in Iraq, as well, and again when the 1941 British, uh, the 1941 British occupation of Iraq. The other nationalist discourse on martyrdom drew on a nationalist, on a Ba'athist reading of Iraqi history. The Iraqi Ba'ath saw itself as the sole representative and protector of, the Arab, nas of Arab nationalism within Iraq and designated all those who had died fighting for its sanctioned version of Arab na nationalism as its own martyrs, even though they were non-Ba'athist. The, um, any Iraqis who had did not die for the Arab Baptist version of Iraqi history were excluded from the narrative of sacrifice for the nation because they were putatively outside that nation. The war with Iran was a war to preserve Arab greatness of Iraq against the sectarian and divisive intentions of an outside enemy, just as the struggle against Iraqi enemies, whether they be communist, the Communist Party, or the Shia Islamist Party, or Kurdish Nationalist Party, such as just as uh, the, uh, at that struggle against Iraqi enemies of the Ba'ath preserved the unity of the nation against the sectarianism on, of internal opponents to that unity. In constructing the cult of martyrdom of Sadisi at Saddam, the government had to address the fact that the war with Iran pitted it against an Islamic revolutionary state government that tapped into the rhetoric and rituals of martyrdom inherent in an emotional Shi'i historical narrative of death and redemption. The Iranian government linked the seventh century martyrdom of Imam Hussein on the plains of Karbala with its what it called, that it called the uh, war with Iraq as holy defense against Iraq. In the former, Imam Hussein was martyred while fighting against the establishment of an unjust Islamic political order. In the latter, Iranians were dying in defense of a just Islamic order. Elaborate rituals of mobilization and mourning accompanied by a visual iconography that situated martyrdom for the nation in the context of Shi'i suffering provided powerful means for the Iranian government of creating consensus on the human costs of the war. Now, we all know by now that the majority of the Iraqi population are Shi'is. In Iraq, little effort was made to connect the martyrdom of the nation to the martyrdom of Imam Hussein because the government viewed rituals of commemoration associated with his death as foreign to uh, Iraqi Arab Shi'is. 
Any attempt to incorporate them into the morning rituals associated with fallen soldiers could reinforce the sectarian allegiances of the Shi'i at the expense of their allegiances to the nation. While official commemorations or incorporated aspects of religious rituals, these were highly circumscribed and closely controlled. The state did not create special cemeteries as, as existed in Iran, for example, for the war dead of the Iran-Iraq war, and could not serve, that could serve as spaces of collective mourning. Nor did it allow for community or local organizations in various areas of Iraq to erect memorials for the dead, as happened, for example, in Europe. Any such memorials were government funded and controlled by the Ba'ath Party. No semi-official intergovernmental agency for martyrs families allowed, was allowed to exist. All aspects of remembrance were prescribed and public questioning of the state assigned meaning of martyrdom was not possible. Burials and rituals built around family condolences, however, were organized independently of the state. It is here that some challenge to the officially sanctioned meaning of martyrdom was possible. As a result, these occasions were closely monitored by the Ba'ath Party. The consensus on the commemoration of and meaning of martyrdom was shattered in the aftermath of the Gulf War. A debate ensued within the Ba'ath Party and the regime leadership on how to commemorate the mother of all battles. Not only was the heroic version of martyrdom for the nation shattered because of the defeat and withdrawal of the armed forces in 1991, it had become clear to most Iraqis that the nation itself was a precarious community that could disintegrate into chaos and violence as the 1991 uprising demonstrated. Faced with the breakup of the heroic national narrative on the meaning of death, the political leadership sought to highlight the narrative of victimization. The government chose Amiriya shelter, bombed by the US on February 13, 1991, as the site of commemoration. By 1994, February 13th, the date of the bombing was declared the date, uh, the national day of mourning for the dead of the first Gulf War. And the choice of the government was driven by two factors. The popular and often spontaneous grief over the bombing of the shelter demonstrated by the Iraqi population gave the Iraqi regime impetus to channel popular sentiments towards a national symbol that could unite Iraqis and divert their attention from the regime's disastrous and divisive policies and the 1991 uprising. Equally, Al Amriya sheltered allowed the political leadership to speak the language of humanitarianism, linking the deaths that ensued from the first Gulf War to the human costs of the embargo. And this is part of the commemoration. And yet you could see this is a, a very literal interpretation of mourning. These are the, the pictures of the dead children. Uh, there were 400 dead in the Amariya shelter. And you could see that let Iraq live is posted uh, at all times to link the death in of, of in Amiriya and its the victimization of its uh, of the population there with the victimization of the population living under the embargo. So according to the new narrative of memorialization, the Iraqi nation was united by its victimization. Its citizens were defined by their steadfastness, smooth, a term used by the government to describe the essence of Iraqi national traits as well as a new generation of Iraqis who were, being, who were growing up under the sanctions. Despite the government's manipulation of the rituals of meaning of Amiriya shelter as a site of commemoration, however, it provided Iraqis with an emotional narrative that used the vocabularies of suffering to protest the embargo. So I'd like to conclude by bringing us uh, to the post-Bathist period. The legal and cultural underpinnings of martyrdom are now being reworked again in Iraq. On January 8, 2006, the Presidential Council in Iraq issued law number three, governing the formation of Martyrs Foundation, independent of any government ministry and funded by the office of the Prime Minister, uh, who at the current moment is, uh, is Nurin Maliki. The foundation's mandate was to determine who was a martyr, provide martyrs' families with entitlements, and ensure that they receive priority in government positions and educational institutions. 
exactly a policy set by the Ba'ath Party. The foundation's overall mission was, uh, in its own word, glorify martyrdom by inculcating the values of sacrifice in society through political, social, and cultural activities. It was charged with creating branches in all provinces of Iraq outside of Iraqi Kurdistan, where the Kurdish regional government created a separate ministry dealing with Kurdish martyrs' affairs. The martyr, according to the new national law, was every Iraqi citizen who had lost his or her life for opposing the Ba'athist regime or for being supportive of those who had opposed it. A few months after issuing the law establishing the Martyrs Foundation, the government passed the law of mass graves. It designated the Ministry of Human Rights as the sole body responsible for the excavation and exhumation of these graves. The ministry determined the manner and time of the victim's death and passed the information on to the local offices of the Martyrs Foundation, which then, de which then determined compensation. The passage of the laws marked the government's attempt to regulate a the process of assigning victims privileges. They came in the wake of a clamor of victims, of victims' families demanding that their loss be acknowledged and compensated. In particular, Shi'i constituencies in the South who had lost family members in the 1991 uprising exerted great pressure on the government to recognize their sacrifice. The laws, however, were meant to exclude a number of Iraqis. Among them were those killed in the US-led invasion and occupation of Iraq and the ensuing chaos. These included civilians and members of the security forces. Their families claimed that their loved ones had been martyred and demanded compensation. The government initially tried to respond, but soon became overwhelmed with the prol proliferation of claims. The law ec also excluded all those who had been declared martyrs of the Iran-Iraq War and the first Gulf Wars, soldiers who had fought in those wars, according to one statement by an Iraqi politician, allied to a Shi'i Islamist party, were not martyrs, but were really merely dead men who had fought in an illegal Ba'athist war. The government conceived the law of martyrdom and mass graves in part to limit and regulate the multi multiplicity of claims to martyrdom by Iraqis who had endured and continue to endure all manners of violence. The passage of law number three and its impl implementation, however, were questioned from the outset. The law was challenged by families of fallen soldiers and missing in action, as well as by families of victims of the post-invasion violence. The narrow definition of martyrdom espoused by the Baghdad government was criticized as sectarian and divisive. It offered no narrative of Iraqi sacrifice for the nation. Iraqis with secular non-sectarian political leanings, as well as those sympathetic to Sunni opposition parties, objected to the exclusion of the Iran-Iraq and first Gulf War martyrs. Even among constituencies in the Shi'i South, where, where many had benefited from the law, the, pre the press often voiced criticism, at least the local regional presses, often voiced criticism of the government's definition of martyrdom and the politicization of its implementation. So the, <coughs> the debate on the meaning and privileges of martyrdom are taking place in the context of the debates on the legacies of Iraq's war under the Ba'ath and their social, political, and environmental impact. More than 30 years later, a contentious but lively debate, relatively open debate, is taking place about the long-term impact of the Iran-Iraq war, particularly the Iran-Iraq war. The debate is unfolding in the context of post-invasion politics and the efforts by the Iraqi and Iranian governments coordinated through International Red Cross Committee to account for prisoners of war and missing in action and to repatriate Iraqi soldiers who had died on Iraqi so Iranian soil. Three competing narratives of the war inform most of these debates. The first, espoused by the Kurdish national gov regional government and the Shi'i Islamist parties that presently dominate Iraq's politics, is that the war, were the, ba the war was a Ba'athist project rather than a national defense one. Insofar as these wars are remembered, it is in the context of Ba'athist repression of the Shia and the Kurds. All other narratives are excised in the name of the de policy. The second trend expressed by Iraqis across the sectarian divide 
is, uh, is an Iraqi nationalist one that sees the war as a legitimate war of defense. Iraqis who adopt this narrative of the war point to Iran's continued influence in Iraqi politics and the intransigence of its allies in Iraq, who refuse to publicly deny Iran's insistence that Iraq instigated the war and that it has legitimate, cl legitimate claims to reparations from Iraq. The third trend, espoused mostly by secular intellectuals and human rights activists, can perhaps be described as post-nationalist. Its proponents argue for a national reckoning with the human social costs of the war, blaming the Ba'athist regime for its instigation and conduct, but rejecting the politicized nature of the dominant sectarian and anti-Iranian Iraqi nationalist narrative of the war. But given the current political climate of Iraq, this group remains a minority. And on, on that depressing note, I'm going to conclude. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Curry, um, for this fascinating presentation. Um, I'm sure there are a good number of questions, but um, perhaps let me lead off by asking if you could just uh, briefly outline a little bit the, um, the sources that you consulted for your work and maybe a little bit more broadly uh, talk about the, um, the state of the um, Iraqi materials um, and archives, both in, in country, but also those that were captured by the U.S. Um, forces uh, after 2003. Uh, so I start with that question. Okay. Uh, I um, used archival sources as well as press uh, and literary sources as well as uh, 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 interviews with soldiers, but I'm assuming the, the, the sources that interest you are the archival ones. Um, I used for my, uh, when I started this project uh, in 2007, I, uh, the Iraq Memory Foundation, which had about, I would say, four to five million documents taken first out of Iraq and given to the uh, United States in uh, 1992, 1992 and then again in 1993 by Kurdish nationalist parties who had taken control of northern Iraq. And these were smuggled out of Iraq through the intercession of uh, Kanaan Makkiya, who eventually founded the Iraq Memory Foundation and brought into the United States in part and uh, housed and digitized within in the United States in part because uh, human Rights Watch and other human rights organizations, as well as the uh, 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 Congress, wanted to uh, find evidence for um, uh, of genocide of the uh, Kurdish populations undertaken by uh, that were gassed in the uh, not gassed actually ethnically cleansed with chemical weapons in, 19 in 1988. Now. These documents eventually were scanned and given to the Iraq Memory Foundation. <coughs> At that time, it was, the, I think, the Iraq uh, Documentation uh, Project, which was housed in, um, in Boston at that time. Eventually, uh, there's another group of documents that was taken out of Iraq in 2003. These were the Ba'ath Regional Command Council documents uh, and these were housed in the green zone in the, uh, in the Ba'ath headquarters. These were taken out. Uh, they were found by uh, a soldier who told Kanaan Makkiya, and Kanaan Makkiya put these documents in his house for a while and then transported them with the help of the Pentagon to the United States, to Virginia. These were scanned, and eventually... Uh, uh, copies were given to the Iraq Memory Foundation, scanned copies to the Iraq found, uh, Memory Foundation. Now, this is the doc these are the documents I worked on. And when I first working on uh, started working on them, the Iraq Memory Foundation was in D.C., had an office in D.C. And uh, Hassan Naimni, the director of uh, its documentation project, gave me access to these uh, uh, to the digitized copies of these documents. 
uh, for both the Ba'ath Party Regional Command and the documents that were taken out in 1992 and 1993, which were documents from the security services, from the Ba'ath uh, Party, from the second and first, um, from the first and fifth Army Corps, which who were stationed in the north of Iraq. Um, and these are the ones that I used uh, mostly for my research. Now, there are other documents. There are documents now at the University of Colorado at Boulder. These are two, to I think they come out to two to three million, if I'm not mistaken. And these were the documents that are, um, uh, that were originally given by the Kurdish national, uh, Nationalist Party. So <coughs> these are there, and I'm not sure, frankly, if the actual documents exist or there and the physically or is it digitized copies of them. I have not looked at them and I suspect at this point they're not, uh, I mean, Ariel, you know about this as well, so feel free to, to, to chip, chip in because Ariel is working as well on this. I don't know if they're uh, uh, indexed in a way that allows us to do any serious research. Have you tried? Yeah, yeah, okay. So that's the nor North Iraq data set, which is at Stanford. So now in 2008, because the Iraq Memory Foundation in DC could not get funding to, to keep it here and to, to keep continue doing its, its work, uh, they reached an agreement with, Har uh, with, uh, with Hoover Institutions at Stanford. And so the documents are now at Stanford. So all of us, and so I did part of my research in at, the at the Hoover in, St in Stanford as well. Um, now, what about the documents in Iraq? Uh, uh, as you know, there was quite a bit of looting uh, that f uh, of the National Library and Archives in Iraq. A great deal has been lost, and the Iraq National Ar uh, Library and Archives is now building it back up again. But the decision has been made, I think, that as far as I know, and at least at the latest telling, that these documents, the originals, that exist at the Hoover Institution uh, will be given back to the Iraqi government. Mm -hmm. But although the Hoover will, will keep the digitized copies and that they will not go into the National Archives, but they, a special archive will be created for them. It is not clear, at, uh, at least uh, the last latest uh, uh, report on this, which was I think about a year ago, it's not clear how this is going to happen and what role the United States government will play in all of this. There's no discussion whatsoever on the Pentagon, the other about 100 million documents that are at the Pentagon or NBU. Okay, thank you. All right, the floor's, floor's open for your questions and comments. Um, if you could please wait for the microphone and identify yourself if uh, you'd like. Who's got a question? Okay, go ahead. Um, um, if you can wait for the microphone, sorry. Okay, Microphone's that. coming. There's. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for your presentation and um, for this opportunity to hear it. Uh, I'm just wondering about comparative um, situations in other countries, um, contemporaneous and historical you may have drawn upon or that would inform your work or be informed by your work? Ah, uh, I think if on what I did quite a bit of um, work on and reading in was comparative work on Europe uh, particularly, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of George Moss's work on fallen soldiers, on uh, Jay Winter's work on uh, war and memory. And what struck me, uh, as, as well some work on the Soviet Union uh, during World War II, uh, what struck me is how different and also uh, the, the situation in Iraq was in terms of commemoration practices than Western Europe, at least. In the Soviet Union, what happens during World War II is a, a, a loosening of controls by, by Stalin. 
And so there's not so much control on issues of commemoration and so on. Uh, I, I also did quite a bit of reading in Israel uh, on the militarization of Israeli society where the war story and particularly the creation of a culture of bereavement and, and commemoration is very much part of uh, the national uh, uh, of, of Israeli uh, nationalism. But there in, um, in Israel, there are organizations that are run by um, uh, families of veterans, uh, of soldiers, who continuously, who benefit from, the, from this culture of bereavement and the entitlements that come to it. I mean, there's a political economy to martyrdom uh, that, uh, that uh, is very well entrenched in both Israel and in Iraq, I think. Uh, that, but there are organizations that, that challenge the official narrative of the state, and this happens in art, this happens in commemorative practices. Um, the difference also is bet uh, for issues of martyrdom and citizenship, there's been quite a bit of work done on, on Iran, where, uh, where, citizenship, where martyrdom is such an important uh, component of privileged citizenship in Iran, and there's quite a bit of resentment now that factors into the opposition politics uh, now on the street to martyrdom, to, to the privileges accruing to martyrdom uh, in Iran. So I drew on all of these traditions, uh, these literatures, to talk about uh, the Iraqi case. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You want to follow up? Yeah, the but yeah. Mic hold on, you just wait for the microphone. <coughs> I was wondering if you uh, took a look at the U.S. Civil War at all? No, because I think I was um, uh, too intimidated uh, by the prospect of dealing with this. You don't publish a book in the United States and talk about martyrdom and rem remembrance within the American <laughs> context. But I was too intimidated by it, to tell you the truth. I did quite do quite a bit of reading in, in the literature on Vietnam, I have to say. So, for example, uh, 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 Tim O'Brien's work uh, uh, is uh, factored into the way uh, my narrative of the soldiers' experiences. And in fact, I drew inspiration in my oral interviews with soldiers from, uh, from Tim O'Brien's uh, work. Uh, so I, in, in the Vietnam War, at least narratives of the Vietnam War by soldiers actually factored in. Yep. Uh, Tina, thank you for the presentation. Um, with this expansion of the party membership to legacy members, children of, the m of martyrs, I can understand the regime's uh, notion that this might be a way to kind of broaden its base, but do you have any sense that it, that it worked? Did, the, did the, the children of martyrs feel like they had any uh, stake in the system if they hadn't been, if their parents hadn't actually been uh, 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 members of the party beforehand? Did, it, did they feel that they were, did they feel like they were brought into the system or was it uh, really a, 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 a false start for them? Uh, it, you know, frankly, it's very difficult to, to see how it worked in the but certainly it seemed in the, pro in, the, in the language of petitions by martyrs' families that the system worked. And in fact, I, I think had the, World War, uh, World War I, had the first Gulf War not happened, we would see an entrenchment uh, of, a, of a certain consensus and of s martyrdom as a citizenship, as a category of citizenship uh, defined as it was defined in the Iraq, uh, Iran war i.e. you die for your country, you have privileges. We might have seen something similar happening to Iran uh, as happened in Iran. But the Iraq, uh, the first Gulf War and the uprising were devastating. Uh, this, so this is, I mean, there's nothing inevitable about the way it happened. It was through rupture and war that this happened. Thank you. Yeah. opened a page that I don't know a lot about, uh, War and Remembrance. Uh, perhaps it's because it's what you found in Iran and Iraq, but is the stress 
uh, on martyrdom common to many cultures other than these two, because it would be easy to explain it as a result of Shia Islam, for example, uh, it's, uh, it also strikes me it's a rather poor model for citizenship uh, because most martyrs are dead and therefore they can't be political leaders. Uh, and and it's, uh, it, it strikes me as a very peculiar, peculiar state of affairs, uh, not exactly what you would consider a nation-building technique that would lead you somewhere except down. Martyrdom, martyrs are losers by and large, the Armenians, the Irish, the the Palestinians or the Israelis, depending on who you're rooting for. Uh, but everybody who's a martyr uh, is a kind of a victim, and therefore the, 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 the underside is the, is the winning combination. Is that not is something, is that something off the target, or is that uh, anything right for you? I, I have to say that my st stress on martyrdom and my interest in it, not only in terms of its commemorative aspects, because this has been done before, but uh, this whole investment in it as a category of citizenship that is privileged came out of two, two um, uh, I, I, two reasons actually that are very real. First of all, the um, uh, my um, reaction to it as it it uh, and it came very clearly right after the 2003 in invasion, as and in other parts of societies where war is perpetual, it's continuous. Uh, uh, as a category of citizenship, it's a losing proposition. Totally, so this says so it's actually in I where issues of social justice, this, uh, uh, inequality of distribution of wealth, issues of building a nation state, you cannot build it on this, but so, at least productively in this. So certainly, uh, it's not a good model for building uh, citizenship, but I think one has to understand it in the context of societies where there is perpetual war. And so when you're talking in a place like Iraq, for example, where uh, by the mid 80s, there were, uh, by 1990, uh, there were 20 million people, 22 million people, about, 700,000 were, de were dead, 630, so, so rough estimates, were fallen soldiers. This is a huge amount of people. And so uh, how do you deal with the social fallout of all of this? So I think certainly it's not the best, best way of constructing citizenship and leadership, but it's... it's Lots of them, little monuments off in one corner, Martyr de la Résistance. That's, uh, you know, a dozen people were shot by the Nazis in this place and so forth. But it's not a national act. And there's not an enormous uh, bureaucracy set up to feed them and to, uh, to provide food for everybody and so forth and so on. It is just a minor little thing. It isn't really a, a part of a national myth that seems to be developing here. And one has to wonder about the health of, of the, the societal health. Yes, but I mean, I think in the context of wars, I mean, it'd be interesting to see how this works, for example, in post-Soviet uh, post societies, where there's also this sort of debate of who do you compensate for their losses uh, 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 because of the regime. But I think the, the European example is that we had tremendous wars for four years and for six years. This is perpetual. I mean, and so it, it feeds, and it's much smaller populations, what we're talking about, it's much more direct. You mentioned the uh, Kurdish uh, dimension of all of this. Could you tell us more about the, the Kurds and how this fits into it? Uh, yes, um, the Kurds began, I mean, the, the, the Kurdish regional government currently in Iraq has its own organization for martyrs, its own, and it's also a definition of martyrs because um, that itself is being contested as well by different constituencies. But the Kurds um, have been more or less autonomous since 1992. So they've been able to build their own national narrative. And because they were the victims of uh, Iraq's, uh, Iraqi Ba'ath, the Ba'athist uh, regime's policies, their, their uh, narrative of martyrdom is much more cohesive, i.e. It, it builds a national narrative. Uh, and of course, it erases 
uh, history as well to build that national narrative. Um, uh, they have their own uh, organizations, their own memorial services. I mean, uh, uh, but it's, and as well, uh, the um, uh, uh, constitution, the re regional constitution of the regional government builds in the same kind of compensations into um, uh, its martyrs. If that was your question, I mean, uh, yeah, okay. Thank you. Sort of a related question. You said um, towards the beginning of your lecture that in the 78, 79 constitution um, that Iraqi citizenship was sort of defined as uh, equal parts Arab Kurd. Um, and so I have just two questions. W first is when does that shift then towards the definition that's a uh, Arab nationalist uh, definition of Iraqi citizenship? And second, um, do you see then, um, mem for lack of a better word, memory politics, the politics of martyrdom, in contemporary Iraq as a, uh, a hindrance now to creating some sort of pan-Iraqi national identity, or could you then once again start to shift um, martyrdom remembrance towards a more Iraqis, Iraqi nationalism? Mm -hmm. The Iraqi, uh, the um Iraqi constitution continue, I mean, even under the Ba'ath, it's Kurd and Arab, although Iraq is made of many other nationalities, it excludes a large number of other ethnic groups in this definition. So for example, Christian Assyrians who are, who, who are an ethnic group are classified under Arab. Um, uh, the shift begins in 1978, 79, uh, where it's still, I mean, in terms of ethnic definitions, it continues to be, uh, uh, Arab and and Kurd, but uh, but the series of exclusions uh, uh, within Arab communities and Kurdish communities now includes Baathist and non-Baathist, or independent. So you have to your Arabness is you're a full Arab with full rights of citizenship in a Baathist state if you belong to the Baath Party, and you uh, believe in its. Uh, Baathist uh, uh, ideology, but at the same time, the um, being a citizen in the Iraqi state during the Iran-Iraq war um, expanded to include martyrs. I mean, in, uh, to include citizen soldiers who don't have to be Baathist. I mean, they inducted them after they died, but if they were living, they didn't have to join. In fact, there is a dip in Baath party membership in the 1980s because the government had needed the soldiers and peoples to, uh, to do so. Now, the second question is on the politics of memory. Um, certainly, if bec because of the policies of, the certain of this current uh, government, there's no attempt to create a narrative of reconciliation at all, uh, built on we all suffered for the past 30 years of our lives, uh, we've lost <coughs> all these people, let's start a dialogue about this, a meaningful dialogue uh, uh, about this. And this is not happening, and, this and part of why it's not happening is internal to Iraqi politics, but also uh, the United States has to take responsibility for this because the system it sets up when it came, uh, when it came to, uh, it's uh, when it conquered Iraq uh, in 2003, in fact, increased the militarization of society and the divisiveness uh, within Iraqi society. Thank you. Is that? I assume that the victims of the sectarian violence has been going on in Iraq. We hear so much about uh, these victims are irrelevant to the idea of martyrdom. Uh, uh, you know, the Shiites and Sunnis. Uh, no, no, they are not at all irrelevant. But uh, but the government. I mean, I'm talking about citizenship in terms of entitlements and rights, and the citizen and the government now is not dealing with that, uh, de doesn't deal with them as victims of the regime. It set the definition of martyrdom very clearly as those victim, uh, victims of Baathist regime. But that doesn't mean that victims of Sunni the violent, for example, 
don't claim that they're martyrs now and make claims. And there are organizations now that are civil society organizations within these communities that are trying to regard these people, uh, these dead, these uh, martyred people as martyrs and tries to recompense them and help their families, but not out within the government itself. You see what I mean? Huh? It's, it's civil society organizations that, as that exist everywhere, uh, I mean here, to support the, vict the, the, uh, the families of the victims of violence, both, sect uh, both sectarian and other kinds of violence. Okay, um, I think you had a question, sir, and then I think we'll bring this yeah, to I mean, um, uh, My question, Dina, is about, uh, is about veterans who are mm -hmm. you know, very prominent in, in the U.S. W w does, does that, does it what, what you've been talking about among the martyrs, more or less, track with veterans? I mean, how do veterans, for example, who fought in the Iran-Iraq war fa feel, feel about that service? Do they feel that they sort of serve their country or do they feel they're sort of duped and sort of forced into a, into a, um, you know, in, in, into risking their lives for, uh, for an illegal, for, for an evil regime? No, veterans, I mean, it depends who I ask, you know. So uh, there are no veteran organizations in Iraq for conscripts. The veteran the, 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 that existed, uh, the, the, the veteran organization that existed was only for people who were, uh, you know, volunteers into the army and the officer corps. And these, th this group of people who I interviewed are completely committed to the idea that they were defending their nation and that they, this was a war that they had, it was a horrible war, but they, it had to be fought. Among a large number of conscripts also, there was uh, no love for the regime and they're totally non-backed, but there was a, a belief that they were fighting a good, not a good war, but a necessary war. Uh, and this is how they, they framed it. So that certainly they didn't feel that they were uh, fighting for the bad. I think th that at the time I interviewed them, uh, the, the country had disintegrated completely. And so it did their the way they answered my questions was colored by the fact that it had, it, the country has fallen apart. So at that time, some of them had nostalgia for that war. It was a good war to fight, you know what I mean, compared to, a, or a legitimate war rather than a good war. It was a legitimate war to fight rather than the first Gulf War and what's happening uh, now. Um, but, uh, and veteran organizations exist also in Iran, for example. This doesn't happen in Iraq, in part because of this continuous war, first at the end of the Gulf, uh, Iran-Iraq war, and then the first Gulf war happened. Thank you. I think we all uh, are indebted to Dina Curry for a fascinating afternoon. Let's give a round of applause. <laughs> and I invite you to uh, join us uh, for a bite and a, a little something outside, in, as usual, to continue the conversation. Thank you. See you next Monday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone uh, a completely new idea. Uh, uh, yeah, it was a new subject for most of them. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah, very good. Thank you.